Wayne Newton has been cheered by audiences around the world, but none more so than the enthusiastic fans in his hometown of Las Vegas. He's lived there now for almost 40 years. This week, Wayne is co-hosting the first Frank Sinatra Celebrity Classic Golf Tournament in Nevada, and I'm pleased to welcome my friend Wayne back to CBS, and thanks for coming on. It's a great thrill to be here. The, uh, the Frank Sinatra story here, which came to an end last week, what was the first time Wayne Newton met Frank Sinatra when you first talked to him? Many years ago, I was uh, after work having a, a, a few uh, vodkas in my dressing room suite, and uh, the phone rings, and an aide picks it up, and he comes back to me and he said, Mr. Sinatra is on the phone. Mm -hmm. And I said, yes, and George Washington is in the other room. <laughs> and uh, he said, no, I, boss, I think it's him. Yeah. So I said, well, have him call back. Because I was sure it was some A clown putting me on. Or, yep, you know. Somebody putting you on. And uh, so in about five minutes, the phone rings again. My aide answers it. And uh, he said, Chief, you better come and talk to this gentleman. And so I went and picked up the phone. I said, hello. And... Uh, a voice said, engine. And I said, yes. And I didn't know whether to be offended or not, right. because I was sure this was not Mr. Sinatra. And uh, he said, we're having a bunch of people over here at Caesars, uh, and we'd like you to come and join us. And I said, well, like how many? <laughs> no, that's not like me. I was just well, sure thinking, it wasn't him. You know. Right, you, you still think you're being put on. Right. Okay. So he said, oh, maybe 25 or 30. I said, why don't you call me when you're not so busy? Really? And there now, was, you, now you still think it's not Sinatra. I still think it's some guy putting me on and hung up. So about 20 minutes, the phone rings, and it's him again. And I go back to the phone, and he says, how's tomorrow night with dinner uh, with just the four of us, your wife and Barbara Ann and myself? And I about died because I realized that it had been him all and along. And usually if people had talked to Mr. Sinatra the way you had spoken to the person you thought oh. was putting you on, he would send somebody over to visit you. Yes, well, or at least hang <laughs> up. <Yeah. laughs> that could be the best thing that happened. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and what is the mission now of the Frank Sinatra Celebrity Golf Tournament to raise money for a charity? I'm well, sure. actually, it's been going on for about uh, 11 years. Right. And, and I think you, you and I both know that uh, this Frank was a man of, of, of pen, you know, he, he had a great great penchants for things. Uh, he was far from being uh, one of those people that just let things go by. No, no, he was quietly generous to many uh, uh, little known causes. And so about 11 years ago, he and his beautiful bride, Barbara, started uh, the Barbara Sinatra Children's Clinic, which takes care of abused children and counsels mm -hmm. them and feeds them and, and all of that. And uh, so about 10 months ago, I got a call from the two of them and said, would you consider co-hosting the first Frank Sinatra uh, golf tournament uh, in Las Vegas? Uh, and I said I would be thrilled. And so uh, it's to raise money for the children's uh, right center the and also a Las Vegas uh, uh, organization known as Opportunity Village, which is uh, for uh, m mentally challenged children. I hope people. you have great success with that, it's and, I'm, been, and I'm sure it, that you will. It's, it's, it's going over like gangbusters. Let me ask you here now when he said engine, because you are Native American. Yes. You know, there's this controversy that continues in this country about nicknames for sports teams. Uh, Braves, Tribe, Warriors, that sort of thing. What's your thought on that? My personal thought is, is that it's much to do about nothing. Really? I, I think that anything that brings a positive image to whatever we are, you know, mm -hmm. Italian, Indian, black, you know, Hispanic, uh, Asian, it doesn't matter. If it brings a positive image to one's mind, then I think it's a plus, plus, plus. It's an all As you situation. say, in your view, it's much ado about nothing. Absolutely. Now, let me, let me ask you, I asked you about Sinatra. I, in, in reading about you this afternoon, I read about some early friends that you made when you were a young man in the business. Uh, so can I give you a couple of names and you'll tell me a story? <laughs> Jack Benny. You worked well, with Jack Benny for three years, I read. Actually, uh, I was Mr. Benny's opening act for close to five. Is that right? And uh, he was one of the most gentle souls I'd ever known. Uh, he was so wonderful. I could not, with my southern upbringing, I couldn't call him by his first name. And so he would say, Wayne, 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 and I'd say, Mr. Benny. And he said, don't call me Mr. Benny. So we had been together about two years, and we were playing at Harris up in Tahoe. And I see him walking across the parking lot at the same time I'm going to the dressing room. Right. And I said, uh, Mr. Benny, and I guess I can say this on national television. Yes, you can. He I said, know what you uh, Hello, schmuck. <laughs> 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 I went, my God. 
And, and he must have noticed the look on my face, and he walked up to me and said, if I can call you schmuck, you can call me Jack. So we agreed on Uncle Jack. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> Another Jack, Jackie Gleason. Well, Mr. Gleason. Uh, uh, there you go, Mr. Gleason. Huh? <laughs> he taught me more, I think, than, than, uh, than even I realized. And, and one of my favorite stories about him was watching him direct his own show uh, that was going to be you know, put on mm -hmm. that night. And he, so he sat with the real director while he you know, uh, did all the blocking. And uh, so I was doing a song that I thought was really hip. It was called uh, uh, Work Gang, Chain Gang. And it just We're working on the chain gang. Working yeah. on, you know, breaking the big rocks on the chain yeah. gang, yeah. breaking rocks and serving my time. And it just, bang, ended. And so this was in rehearsal. And Mr. Gleason called me over and he said, uh, Wayne, come over here. And I said, yes, sir. And he said, when you end the song, let the people know it's over. <laughs> So from that point on, I never did a cute ending again. Gotcha, gotcha. You know, the, uh -huh. the, <laughs> now, at, at, at one time, uh, you opened for Jane Mansfield. Oh, boy. What was that her... was a poor choice of words, though. <laughs> <laughs> Not in the sorrow of the night, schmuck. <laughs> but now, what was, you know, Jane Mansfield was a, uh, was a, a well-endowed, beautiful actress in Hollywood movies. What would her Las Vegas act be? Well, it really wasn't Las Vegas. It was in Buffalo, New York. Well, well wherever it at was. At a place called the Town Casino. She walked out in uh, a beautiful gown, and then she sang one or two songs, and then she would get behind a, a kind of French screen mm -hmm. that you see in movies, and she would take a little bit off. Well, they, these were family people. They had their children with them, and, and so this one night she... I was backstage always because in order to leave the premises, you had to go through the audience. Right. And, and so when, you know, if you opened the show, you were there until the show ended. <laughs> and so I was sitting backstage, and uh, I hear the audience start to boo, which I'd only heard one other time in my life, and that was directed at me. And uh, so I, I stand up, and I, I said to my brother, and and a bass player at the time, I said, something's going on. And I kind of peeked through the curtains, and she had done this uh, mock strip where she just kind of came down, supposed to come down to like a, a huge bra mm -hmm. and, uh, and like a kind of a robe thing from the waist down. Mm -hmm. Well, she hit the wrong button here, and, and everything up. came out. And so um, the place was on the verge of riot. Uh, the owner comes back, running back, with a raincoat. And he said, kid, get ready to go out there. Oh, man. <laughs> you, <laughs> the go, the you lions are in the <laughs> arena, you know. You go out there and fix this, Wayne. Hey, so, kid, save us. They went to a blackout, and he rushed out and put the raincoat around her and took her off stage, and he said, you're on. And I said, to do what? He said, I don't care. Just entertain them. So I and walked calm them down. And calmed them down. And so I walked out, and I stood there for about a minute. And I mean, it was just, it was gaining momentum. And so I looked back at my conductor, and I said, Danny boy. And he said, you're nuts. I said, Danny boy. <laughs> and, and he said, OK. So he looked at the piano player, and he said, Danny boy. And, and so I didn't raise the mic. I knew that you couldn't outshout a group like that. So the only way you could do was to get their attention the other way. So I started singing Danny Boy. <laughs> I must have sung Daddy Boy for 10 minutes. But after about three minutes, you could hear people going, shh, 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 shh. And when they all quit yelling and screaming was the first time I brought the mic to my mouth. And to this day, there are songs that I do on stage without a microphone. Uh -huh. And it's those instances that, that you learn from. Sing Danny Boy, kid. <laughs> <laughs> we will continue with Wayne Newton, who is the co-chair of the Frank Sinatra Celebrity Golf Tournament. The toll-free is up and running here if you'd like to join us, and we'll be right back after this break. Wayne Newton, here is Pam on the toll-free in Dover, Delaware. Hi, Pam, and welcome to CBS Late Night. Hello. Hello. Hi. 
Mr. Newton, I was wondering if there was, I'm a huge fan of yours. Well, thank you. How huge are you, Pam? I, oh. I can remember, <laughs> not that huge. <laughs> okay. I was wondering, at what age did you realize that you wanted to be a performer? And was there any specific incident that made you pursue it? Uh, thank you for the question and thank you for the compliment. Uh, the age was four years old. My parents took me to see a Grand Ole Opry road show that had mm -hmm. come through Roanoke, Virginia. And on that show was Hank Williams and Hawkshaw Hawkins and Kitty Wells. And I, I looked at the people's faces in the audience. And I said, and I saw the happiness mm -hmm. that they had. And I said to my mother, that's what I want to do. And she said, what? I said, that. And so that's when I started taking music lessons. And yeah. so I had a local radio show at the age of five before going to school, a local television show when I was 10 for four years, wow. uh, and then to Las Vegas at 15. Well, you do a very wonderful job and make a lot of people very happy. I well, love I, you I will Thank attest you. to that. I've seen uh, Wayne Newton perform on two occasions, and uh, he is one of the hardest working people in our business. And uh, have you seen him in person, Pam? No, I've well, never Well, he, been gi that he lucky. gives a hell of a show, I've got to tell you. He's, he's <laughs> all over you. the stage, and he never stops entertaining. He's wonderful. Thank you. You're welcome, sir. Pam, thanks for calling. Thank you very much, and, and we're going to miss you when you leave. Well, it's a while yet, Pam, but I appreciate that. Stay tuned for more details, okay? Thank you. All right, dear Pamela, good night now. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Uh, you mentioned in the break, uh, you, you talked about Sinatra inviting you and your wife to have dinner with he and his wife the next night. Right. You went to the dinner, I assume, and, and how, I should have asked you, how did it go? We went to the dinner. It was wonderful. He has a fabulous sense of humor. He said to me, are you going to come and watch part of my show? And I said, well, I have one of my own I have to do. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, come and sit through a couple of songs anyway. And I said, of course. So little did I realize that I was going to be right up against the stage uh, with my wife across from me and Barbara Ann, who's a beautiful lady, next to me. But there was no way out. It was so packed. Oh, I got you. You couldn't, you couldn't, I couldn't leave, get you out. You couldn't leave unnoticed. That's right. Yeah. And so I said to her, I really have to go. And she said, climb over the stage. I said, he'll kill me. <laughs> and she said, climb over the stage. So I waited for the right moment that I thought was the right moment. And I stepped up in the chair, and I got up on the stage. And just as I was about to say, excuse me, sir, he said, the bathroom is that way. <laughs> <laughs> he helped you out, huh? <laughs> now, what is it? I hear that. What have you got for Robert Goulet? I mean, you, I, I read this afternoon, you, you're a prankster with Goulet. You, oh, I've done you some make him terrible nuts. things to him. I've done some terrible things to him. Uh, I, I, I dressed up three ladies. <laughs> Forgive me, Father. I, I dressed, dressed up three ladies as nuns, and, and I held the three seats ringside at his show. Oh, come on. And I waited until he was in, like, his second song, and I had called the light booth and said, there are three nuns from Buffalo. St. Mary's. Every town has a St. Mary's. Yeah, exactly. You know that. Yeah. And so I said, they're, they're going to be coming to the show. So a, as they are seated, just kind of let the spotlight Le fall, linger. Le lean on them yeah, a little yeah. bit, uh, because it will embarrass them, and they'll love it. And uh, all the time I was setting up Goulet, yeah, yeah. and knowing that he had to go right to them. Well, I'd also written four of the most obscene notes. <laughs> <laughs> that you have ever witnessed in your life. And gave them to the nuns. And gave them to the nuns. And I said, now, when he talks to you, give him one at a time. <laughs> knowing you, that he, you did that to Robert Goulet. Knowing <laughs> I sent out a live chimp dressed with the little, <laughs> you know, the little French uh, beret. Chapeau. Uh, yeah, and, 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 uh, and put him on a stool. I said, your, your favorite fan from France is here. Oh, and I come walking out with a chimp. He starts singing to the chimp, and the chimp starts to pee. <laughs> and, and, and I mean, when you, I, I stole all of the furniture out of his dressing room one You're night. You're kidding me. Oh. What is it with you and Goulet? Well, I, I love him. I mean, he really has a wonderful sense of humor. Didn't you play a violin in his orchestra? Oh, I, I, he was at, uh, at the Dunes. He wasn't even part of the Summa chain. Then he had gone over the Dunes for some reason. And I snuck into the violin section, just where he couldn't see me. And he gets into, if ever I should leave you. Can you play the violin at all? And, yes, I do. But I did deliberately play very badly. And so he... 
you you could see that he didn't want to explode. You know, he and so he'd look back at his conductor, he said, I think we have a problem up there. And he said, Let's start the song again. And so I waited for the moment again and I did exactly the same. It took him four times to realize that I was doing that to him. And does this continue? I mean, oh. and does he pay you back in any way? Oh, it, well, I went on television, and I said, I ran into Bob Goulet on the street, and he was really depressed. He had cut himself shaving, and his legs were still bleeding. <laughs> <laughs> and he went on some show, and he said, I've known Wayne Newton since he sounded like a girl. He said, now he's matured, and he sounds like a woman. So... <laughs> <laughs> That's very good. That's very sweet. Yeah. <laughs> Let me take a fast break with Wayne Newton, who is the co-host of the Frank Sinatra Celebrity Classic Golf Tournament. It's this weekend in Las Vegas, this weekend. right? Uh, the public is invited at no charge to Free see the tournament. No charge. And there's a black tie dinner, and there are still a few tickets available on Wednesday. That's actually, it's a gala, and Quincy Jones is producing it, and it's going to be phenomenal. Terrific. Anyway, we'll continue with Wayne Newton for a few more minutes here and be joined later on by uh, Molly Ivins and you on the toll-free after uh, these words from CBS. With Wayne Newton, here is Joseph on the toll-free in North Palm Beach, Florida. Hello, and welcome to CBS. Good evening. Mr. Newton. Good evening, Thank Joseph. You, Joe. Uh, it's good talking to you again, uh, Mr. Snyder. Thank uh, you. I would like to just ask Mr. Newton uh, if he could tell us about his fondest memories of working with Lucille Ball. I think that my fondest memories, thank you again, uh, would be twofold. Uh, number one, little Lucy and I became very dear friends. And I didn't know until they had done an A&E biography special on me that uh, she had a crush. Uh, really? Which was really, really nice. That's and, very cute. Uh, and they're terrific people, both of them. But Lucy did me the fa greatest favor of my life. I did the, the very famous show with the cows and the chickens and all of that. Of course. And they were going to do um, a series around that show. And she brought the president of the network up to see me and all of that. And she said, would you please come to my suite after the show? Mm -hmm. And so I did. And she said, I want you to know that we want you to do this show. Uh, you'll do it at Desilu, and it'll be all that you want it to be. If that's what you want, but remember something, the character that you play, you will have to live with the rest of your life. Uh, as in Gomer Pyle and Jim Neighbors. And if that's not truly you, then you should turn this down. And I did. No kidding. So she was straight with she you? She was, I mean, what, who would have done that for you? And the character would have been again? It was the country boy, the yeah. hick, the bumpkin. You know, okay. the bumpkin. Yep. Right. Well, of little known fact there, Joseph. <laughs> well, uh, Mr. Newton, you are one of the greatest entertainers. Unfortunately, I have not been able to see you yet, but many people who have seen you have told me about how magical your presence is. He's unbelievable, Joseph. I'll tell you, one of the great ones on stage. That's true. Uh, could you tell us also about the eucalyptus drop that you use every night on stage? It's just a curiosity. Now, who told you about that? The eucalyptus drop, Joseph. <laughs> uh, well, these, uh, these neighbors of mine up in Ohio who um, be have been to one of your concerts say that throughout the whole show you have a little eucalyptus drop and it doesn't affect your voice or your performance at all. It was, it's, it's just a little curiosity. It, okay, here, here's how that came about. Uh, Elvis, who was a dear friend of mine also, uh, when he was playing Vegas, would suffer from what people know as Vegas throat. In reality, what that is, is that most people who come to Vegas are not used to doing that many shows that in, in that many days. Mm -hmm. And so they're not really prepared for it. Uh, so they get a little raspy and that kind of thing. He, uh, a friend of his from England, came up with these little eucalyptus drops. They taste terrible. But they open up all your sinuses and your throat, really? and uh, and I have one every single time before I walk Is on stage. Is that right? Yes. Have you ever heard of something that you would buy at the drugstore called Dobell's Solution? No, I it's it's not. got oil of clove in it, and I'm I'm told that people who use their voices a lot, such as singers and or actors, would gargle with this oil of clove, which had a very soothing effect on the vocal cords in the throat. And I've tried that over the years, and I, I find it to be quite helpful. Mm, I will try it. Yeah. Uh, oh, well, if the eucalyptus thing works It for does you. work, and, and, you know, it might be as much mental as it is physical. There, okay, but okay. Really Have you got work. any on you? Uh, no, but I'll send you some. No, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I only have them when I'm... In fact, they're in my makeup kit, so I do have some. <laughs> Joseph, I'm glad you called. Very perceptive question about the eucalyptus, and thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you very much. Late night will not, will not be the same without you, Mr. Snyder. You're very kind, Joseph. Be well, and I'll talk to you again soon. Thank you. All right, good, good night, sir. 
Uh, do you still have, and I don't know if we've ever talked about this, but I've read about this, you, as a kid, you, you had, I don't want to call it ESP, but you could, you could like forecast the weather pretty well, and you could kind of see things coming. Do, do you still do that? I still do it to, to the extent, and I don't want to pe have people think that... that You're not a medalist or... No, uh, none of those kind yeah, of things. Okay. I, I believe that those of us that do what we do, uh, we being you and I, mm -hmm. and those of us that walk on stage every night, we are receivers. Uh, yeah. Part of what we do is read the people that we're performing mm -hmm. to. And by reading them, I don't mean anything that they say or do. No, no. There's just vibes that come at you. There is an aura. There's That's a presence. Right. There's no question and, about that. And when you do that enough, and when you're really not cognizant of it, I mean, it's not something that you prey on, you know. Right. Uh, you begin to develop a kind of a sixth sense about people, mm -hmm. about things. Uh, uh, I've had uh, situations that scared me. But if what? someone, well, my, my dad said to me one time, we have a birthday gift that we went to, a Christmas gift, we have, that we went to a lot of trouble to get. And there's no way, use your ESP or whatever you yeah. think you have. So he dared, dared you to guess what the present was, yeah. And for some reason, I was just in that mood, and I said, I, I don't, all I see is, is baby shoes. And his eyes got about that big, and he looked at my mother, and he said, did you tell him? And they had taken my baby shoes and had them bronzed. Oh, bronzed, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and so it's those kind of things, you know, but it, it's not. Let me ask you about being a receiver here. About three weeks ago in New York, I interviewed Alan Alda, who's currently appearing in a play back on Broadway, which is very, in which he's brilliant. It's called Art. He said, you know, some nights an audience will take this cast, he and the two other fellows, and by their response to what we do on stage, they will make us go places we have never gone before. Absolutely. At, with singers, too. Absolutely. If the audience, they can, they can propel you, right? Totally control you. And it's very interesting when that happens. Yeah. If, if, if they're receptive to what you're doing, that it inspires you to do things Feels that, good, you, it, huh? yeah. that you wouldn't do ordinarily. Uh, if, if they're not receptive to what you're doing, that it inspires you to, you know, I, I joke about it, I, I say to people, you know, sometimes when a performer gets a tough audience like you are, they'll cut their show short and leave. I say, not me. I stay till you like me. So, <laughs> we, we were here until three this morning, and if you want to get out of here before then. Like you know, <laughs> so I You know, I may start that here. You know? <laughs> we might be here at four or five o'clock in the morning. <laughs> I wish you great success this weekend with the Frank Sinatra Golf Tournament, and thank you for all you've done for me over the years, and I hope to see you again soon. God bless you. Bless you friend. back, my friend. Take thank care. You. Okay, Wayne Newton, check out the Frank Sinatra Celebrity Classic in Las Vegas. It'll be in all the papers as to venues and, uh, and make this a big hit for Wayne and for the memory of Frank Sinatra. We'll be right back with columnist Molly Ivins after this short break. Tomorrow night we have Kathy Griffin with us uh, from uh, Suddenly Susan, as I believe, on another network. And as Mr. Kennedy asked before the show, what about Brooke Shields? And the reason that she won't be here tomorrow night will be the subject of my opening commentary tomorrow. <laughs> no, I've made mistakes in the past, as Molly Ivins admits, and I made a mistake with Brooke Shields uh, many, many years ago, and I am probably still paying for it today, but it's a payment that I'm delighted to make. Uh, also tomorrow night we go undercover with the FBI, which is one of our stronger segments. <laughs> As the elephant said to the naked man, okay, it's cute, but can it pick up the peanuts? Good night, everybody. Oh, 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 oh.